Good morning to those of you who I was told this morning don't have a life because we're all here and everybody else is having Memorial Day plans. I don't believe that. I told Don he's wrong. Where is he? He walked out. Yeah, that's good for him. Memorial Day weekend. Time for with friends and family. I hope you guys have a have a great time. At least a day off tomorrow, right? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Love having a day off. No complaints there. Uh, I want to just uh, remind you. Next Sunday, we there is nothing going on in this building. Um, there will be signs on all of the doors saying go to the high school gym. So there's nothing here. No go deeper time. No coffee. Nothing. Okay, so uh, we love you all. We love having you here. But as a ministerial alliance, we felt it's very important for us to continue to to find ways uh, for us as churches to come together and say, there might be things uh, that guide us, but in the big picture as far as who Jesus is and the fact that we love him and follow after him, um, there are things that we can do together. And so we continue on a, on a monthly basis to ask the question, what are the things that God's calling us to do together? And one of those things that we feel like God's leading us to was this VBS service. So uh, you might be tempted, because the thought's gone through my mind, and I've heard it expressed by someone else close to me, Dad, that, um, that, that you don't have kids that are in the, in the VBS uh, program um, there, I'm, I, I shouldn't say this, but there's not these chairs. We won't have them there. They're going to be the regular chairs that you would have if you were in the high school gym. But I encourage you to be there. Um, it is as important to show unity and and uh, a need for one another as a body. We need one another that are that are here within this room, but we also need one another from church to church. So uh, that is not. Don't let that come across as guilt statements if, if you're not able to be there, but I just I want to reinforce to you uh, just how important it is for us as a body to join together bigger than beyond Heston MB Church, and that's what we have the opportunity uh, to do next Sunday morning. So invite you to be there. We push back to start time even, right? 10.30? 10:30, and uh, the VBS committee that uh, JL helps to, to head that up. They put together the service, and we, as a ministerial alliance, said, "Tell us what you want us to do." Um, and so uh, we're there to serve them. In fact, because of that, we're handing out bulletins. But I, I'm just telling you, they're they're what they like. So, anyways, this morning. Uh, we're we're going to be looking at parables uh, throughout the summer. We finished uh, Philippians. Uh, we're going to, uh, I, I think we're going to start in, in 1 Timothy come uh, the end of, of August. But between now and then, it's like, okay, so what do we do? Do I pick a short book, this, that, and the other? Decided on parables. And uh, this morning is, is an introductory to parables in, in general. So we're going to be, I, I don't know what you know about par- parables or what you think about parables. In fact, with that in mind, why, why don't you take the little quiz uh, that's on the front of your bulletin? There are three questions there at, at, the, uh, at the top of um, my, the notes page. There are three questions. Uh, pretty easy. So uh, you can uh, use the pencil that's uh, there with your with the sign-in pad. The only place you might have to write an example uh, on is number two, hint, hint. Uh, So I'm not going to tell you the answer to number two, but if you answer it correctly, you might have to write an example. So uh, look at those, just a moment there. Um, What do you know about the parables? You can work with your neighbor if you need to, so go ahead and talk amongst yourself. That's fine, too. We're going to be looking at parables, talking about parables. There's things I learned this week about parables that uh, I was not aware of. The first one would be, what is the definition of a parable? The correct answer is, you can confidently say the correct answer is B. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so we're going to be looking a little bit about, uh, about that. It's not a pair of bulls, which is also a great answer, but it's not correct. So it's... It's, uh, it's letter B. It's a, it's a story that was used not just by Jesus, but by rabbis and by people as, as they're teaching uh, in general. People will use stories that have 
specifically that are, are true to life uh, here on earth, uh, but sp- uh, also point to a heavenly meaning that, that God would have us to know. Second of all, are there parables in the Old Testament? Yes, there are parables in the Old Testament. Uh, they would say up to 12 parables in the Old Testament. I'll refer to one and use an example later from uh, the life of, of Nathan and, and David. Uh, another one within that would be uh, also some, some thoughts from uh, some of the stories that Samson used. So it's, it's an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. Okay, So there are some parables in the Old Testament. And then third, the purpose of a parable is to, what would you say? See? Okay, well, and that is correct. Um, The only answer that is not uh, true in and of itself would probably uh, be A, um, and we'll get to that. So I know that sounds strange. How can A be not true, but C, be true? Um, We'll get to that, but uh, it's to reveal and conceal truth, and we'll be looking at at some of those uh, reasons for that. But parables is our topic. We'll be specifically in, in, for the most part, Matthew chapter 13. That's on page 794, so I invite you to to turn there. But before we dive into this passage, I'm just going to again invite you to uh, bow your heads and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Uh, Opportunity to hear, what does God have to say to me this morning? What are the things that that he might be challenging uh, us as a body towards? And uh, how is he going to work in and through this in our lives? Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we we come together this morning. Uh, You've commanded us to gather with other believers. You've commanded us. You've created the church. This is your idea. And Lord, we want to be faithful, not to what the world wants or even what others want, but but to what you want. And and because of that, Lord, we continue to go back to to your word and and trust your spirit to guide us to truth and, and to guide us to not only the truth that you would have for our body, but also, Lord, uh, you know right where we're at this morning. We come with our our hurts and our pain. We come with the the joy and excitement of of summer, family. We also come, Lord, and and we have to admit we we have sin in our lives. And we ask for forgiveness. Lord, we ask you to cleanse us. We ask you to remind us of the work that you did on the the cross. Um, Thank you so much for that. We we celebrate you this morning, Lord. As we look into your word, uh, speak to our hearts. uh, Guide us to the the methods and, and to the and to the attitudes that that your spirit would call us to. We trust you for that. We love you, and we thank you for this time together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing we need to do, now that we're done with the quiz and we kind of know where we stand with parables, first thing we need to do is to look at the context of the passage that we'll be studying this morning. And the passage that we have is... Matthew chapter 13 and starting in verse 10. So I'm going to just invite you to look back one chapter. We're not going to read all of that, but chapter 12 sets the stage for where we're at in chapter 13. In chapter 12, we see Jesus walking through a grain field with his, with his disciples. And he reaches and, and they, they take the grains of wheat they take the grains of, of wheat and they, and they rub them together in their hands. And, and there were Pharisees that said, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Jesus and the disciples were called out for, for what they were doing. They were, they were working on the Sabbath. And Jesus in his explanation to the Pharisees in verse 8, he says, 
Yes, we can, we can grind this wheat in our hands. It says, verse 8, For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus tells the Pharisees that he is over the Sabbath, that he is the one that rules, that dominates. And this has been Jesus' message from the very beginning. In fact, this has been the message since before Jesus began his ministry. John the Baptist, in Matthew chapter 3, in verse 2, it says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is coming. They had been looking for the kingdom of heaven, and here is Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, and he says, and has been teaching, I'm the one you've been looking for. You've been looking for freedom. You've been looking for salvation. That kingdom is here. I've arrived. I've arrived. The kingdom is here. And he's been very straightforward in telling them that. The fact that he was telling the Pharisees, the, the leaders of the church, hey, I'm the one, I'm the Messiah, he was right up in their face. He did not beat around the bush. In verse 10, he was then brought a man, and he was asked the question, actually in the first example we have here, the Pharisees then asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So Jesus had just told them it was, it was lawful to eat on the Sabbath, because he was the Lord of the Sabbath. Then Jesus, in these verses, in verses 10 through 14, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. And not only that, they bring him another person in verse 22, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And guess what Jesus does? He heals again. He has, he has broken three of the commands that morning, that day, on the Sabbath. He has eaten on the Sabbath. He has healed twice on the Sabbath. And after the second healing, after the healing of the demon-possessed man, The Pharisees say to him, Are you the Son of God, or are you actually the Son of Satan? Now, take a minute and think about that. Jesus had, had just taken demons and sent them out of a man. And the, and the church leaders turn and say, Well, did he do that because he's the Son of God, or is he actually the Son of Satan? Is he actually a, a, a demon? And Jesus then goes on and talks to these Pharisees and to those that were listening and saying, listen, there is, there's only one sin that I will not forgive. There's only one sin that I will not forgive. And that is when you see the Spirit at work and when you're being convicted of sin and when you're being convicted and saying, you're called to follow after Jesus and not to follow after yourself. You're called to follow after him. The only sin that I will not forgive one day when you're standing in front of your heavenly father is that I am God's son. That is the only sin that I will not forget, forgive. I will not forgive that. So someday, we will all be standing before our heavenly father. And the question will be, do you choose Jesus as your savior or have you chosen to follow after yourself or your own desires? And Jesus has said, those of us who have said, you know what, I'm going to go my own way, I've got to figure it out, I can trust in my own works to save me, he says that is not forgivable. But everyone who's trusted in Jesus as their personal Savior, who has said, no, it's the work on the cross, he will forgive those. He will forgive all their sins. And what we see here, as we go then into Matthew chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, that same day, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Chapter 12 moves right into chapter 13. These events were all taking place on that same day. Now, I bring that up because as we went through Ezra and Nehemiah here the last couple of years, you know that between one verse and the next, sometimes there can be, what, 100 years that take place? Other times, 400 years that, that transpire between one verse and the next verse. And yet here... We see in, in Jesus' life that at the end of 
of chapter 12 going into chapter 13, that same day, Jesus went out and he was on the lake. And he taught the people. And in verse 3 it says, Then Jesus told them many things in a parable, saying, and he goes on to give the parable of the sower. He told them a, a parable. And that brings us to verse 10. Because after he had told them the parable of the sower, it says in verse 10, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? You see, this morning it's important to remember that parables reveal truth. We're going to be looking at the fact that parables reveal truth and conceal truth, and we'll be looking in just a moment at verse 7, specifically at, at what Jesus says to the disciples explaining why he used parables. But, but first we need to know that parables do re reveal truth. They reveal truth. The word parable in Greek is parabole. Parabole. And that's my Spanish accent using a Greek word. And that's how you get parabole. But the word parabole or parable means to place beside. To place beside. It, what came to my mind is, is the root word, which also leads to the, the word parallel, right? To place beside. Uh, for two things to be running parallel to one another. I, again, the, the idea of being perhaps like a railroad track, right? That they're both headed the same direction, and a parable, this story with a, that's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, runs parallel with the truth of the kingdom. Jesus was teaching the truth of the kingdom, and now he brings a parallel story to run next to that truth. Both headed in the same direction, ending at the same place, but through the use of parables. Parables revealed who was listening to Jesus. It revealed two different types of people. It revealed those who were truth seekers, and it revealed those who were ambulance chasers. Do you know what an ambulance chaser is? Ambulance chaser is one who, when they hear the siren, like perhaps even for the tornado, you, you, instead of seeking shelter or praying for those who might be in danger, you go out and try to see, I, I want to see the, the big, what the excitement's all about, right? So specifically with tornadoes, how many times does the, the siren go off? And in Kansas, that means oh, we go and we try to find out where the, where the tornado's at. Jesus was separating the, those who wanted to know truth from those who weren't looking for the truth. Those who wanted to know that those that just wanted to see the show. That just wanted to know what is it that Jesus is going to do today? I heard that Jesus is around. Let, let's go and let's go, just go see what, he, what he's doing. Also, parables reveal and promote an active listener. It promotes an active listener. So, as Jesus was using a story or as a speaker uses a story, you have to follow along and, and, and pay attention to who, who are the characters in this story and how do they tie together and what's the main point that's, that's attempted to be used in, in, in the story that's being, that's being told. There, there are three theologians that I'd like to share a couple quotes that they give in explaining what a parable is. The first one is from William Barclay. Uh, not Charles Barclay, William Barclay. Uh, he's a theologian, and he says, parables don't simply convey inform information or mask it. So he's saying it's, it's not about revealing or concealing. They challenge the hearer. They challenge the hearer. So as we talk and we listen and we study parables over this summer months, they should cause us to be challenged. Second of all, D.A. Carson D.A. Carson, not Carson Burkholder, D.A. Carson. He says, parables reveal truth to him who desire truth, and it con conceals truth from him who does not wish to see the truth. There's going to be, need to be some effort that's given on the hearer's part in order to understand what a parable means. And thirdly, from Matthew Henry, and the only other one I could think of was O. Henry, and that wasn't even really a person, um, Matthew Henry said parables, and, and this one, um, I think as we go along, is, is the most intriguing of the quotes. Parables are a shell that protect good fruit for the diligent. Parables are a shell that protect good fruit 
for the diligent. So there's fruit, there's truth to be found. But it's concealed. It's concealed. Parables also enable us to be able to give a story or give a, perhaps that you might use the word, a, a hook for, for you to remember something and for it to stick in your mind. For example, uh, I could say, you, if you only eat donuts, you'll get fat. Right? If you, if you only eat donuts, you'll get fat. Or I could say, if you only eat donuts, you'll get as big as an elephant. And, and what I've done is taking a fact that if, if we only eat donuts, we're going to get big, and, and said, oh, for example, like an elephant, right? So even as a speaker, you have the opportunity to, to put an image in someone's mind. And you can't unsee that, can you? You can't unsee that. But if I eat a lot of donuts, that's the way I'll end up uh, looking. And someday when I'm no longer here, I'll just be known as the pastor that looked like an elephant, right? That, but that's a hook that will be in your brain somewhere. And that's what parables do. It gives, a, it gives a place to hang some things on that hook. What are the truths that are being taught? What are the truths that are being taught? You're also able to say things that you might not be able to get away with saying otherwise. You can say things to people and use a story, and not maybe everybody catches it, but you can get away with saying things that, that you otherwise couldn't. Just take a moment, and we're going to turn back to the Old Testament, okay? So, so keep your, your, uh, your, our passage marked there in Matthew chapter 13, because we're coming back there. But I'm going to take you back to 2 Samuel chapter 12. If you go back to 2 Samuel chapter 12, and I'm going to set this up while you're, while you're turning there, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, what had just taken place was um, David had had wanted Bathsheba. He had seen her from the, the roof of, of his castle. He had seen her bathing. He had said, I would like her to come up here to, to my room. And when she came there, he found out in the end she was married. Uh, he wanted her to be his wife, so he had her husband. Then, uh, and then uh, David married her instead. God sends the prophet Nathan to David. And this is, are the words that Nathan said to the Almighty King. He said some very straightforward things to him. Look at 2 Samuel 12, verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When Nathan came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and, he grew, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. So that little lamb would jump up on his lap and uh, would sleep there uh, in, in the poor man's arms. Lost my spot there. Even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. So a very special lamb. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had came to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan. So here's David saying, this is a real story. This really happened. David's upset. As surely as the Lord lives, that rich man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. The story had its desire effect. David heard the story that he believed to be true and he said, how dare he? That man should die or, or at least he should pay for it. And what does Nathan say in, in verse 7? Nathan said to David, you are that man. David had sinned. Nathan came and was able to say to him, tell him a, a story, a parable, that had another meaning, had a, a truth that David needed to hear in his heart. Verse 13, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David got it. And hopefully, over the coming weeks, as the Spirit speaks to us, and this is true every week, but especially as we look at parables, 
As the Spirit speaks, we will understand where we fit. How do we fit into the parable? Because, as was mentioned, it, it reveals truth, but it's like a shell that's protecting that fruit. We need to be diligent in, in searching for it. You can get away with saying things that might otherwise come across as offensive. Lastly, besides revealing truth, we see from what Jesus say, says in verses 11 through 17 that it conceals truth. We'll start with verse 10, going back to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, verse 10, the disciples said to Jesus, why do you speak in, to the people in parables? Why have you changed from straight talk to parables now? Verse 11, Jesus replied, because the, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. Jesus says to them, you've been given the secrets of the kingdom. Now, was the kingdom secret? No, he'd been telling them straightforward all about the kingdom that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. What were the people wanting the kingdom to be? The people wanted the kingdom to be that Jesus was going to come and liberate them from the Romans, that they would no longer be slaves, that they would no longer be oppressed by the Roman government. Jesus, though, he says, the kingdom isn't of this world. He says, I've come to bring you not freedom from Rome, but freedom from sin, freedom from guilt. I've come to take away that burden of sin. And going forward, what we will see in Matthew and Mark, Luke, as parables are used, all 40 of them, or more, because the theologians don't agree which are parables and which aren't and which verses you can apply, but there's at least 40 parables. Every parable talks of salvation. It points to the spiritual kingdom. It points to the gospel. And second of all, going forward, every time Jesus will speak to crowds, he uses a parable. In fact, if you turn over just one page in, in my Bible, if you turn over to Matthew 13, still in that chapter, verse 34 and 35, it says this, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. He didn't say anything to them without using a parable. So it was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophets. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Amazing though, isn't it? That Jesus says, and Scripture says, that the parables that Jesus will use are going to reveal things that have been hidden since the beginning of the time. Since God created this world... There are things that are hidden that will be revealed through parables that haven't been revealed before. He's speaking of the kingdom to come. He's speaking of salvation that comes when, when he dies on the cross for our sins. Those things will be revealed. And verse 13, it says, and this is why. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Again, Specifically, he's talking about the Pharisees, but there were others that were ambulance chasers that wanted to see a show, that wanted to argue, that wanted to argue, and, and he says to them, they hear, but they don't really understand, and they, and they see, but they don't perceive. If you look at verses 14 and 15, this comes from Isaiah chapter 6. He, he paraphrased it in, in, verse, in verse 13, but in, in verses 14 and 15, Jesus quotes from Isaiah 6, In them, or in these scriptures, is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Why is that? For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and I will heal them. There are two conditions 
of the heart that are explained here? Two conditions. The first one, in verse 14, says that the reason that they see but don't perceive, the, the reason they hear but don't understand, is because their heart is calloused. Their heart is calloused. Parables kept hard hearts from getting harder. Parables keep hard hearts from getting harder. Jesus was having mercy on those that were there just for the argument. How many times do you find when, when you first start committing a sin, there's conviction, there's a desire to make things right, but as we continue to go back to it, right, does it get easier and easier to do the same thing and, and you don't feel as guilty? For example, and this happened to a good friend of mine, not to me, of course, um, how about... How about back in school when, when you would cheat on a test, right? And, and you look at somebody else's test or, or maybe you didn't get the work done, you had a game the night before, and you get to school and you just quickly write down somebody else's work. I mean, there's a lot of good reasons why I should do that or why my friend should do that. But you, you do that and you know it's not right, right? I know I shouldn't be looking at somebody else's paper. I know I shouldn't be writing that stuff down. And yet... It was so easy to do, and, and I needed just to, and we justify it, and, and yet we, we also know it wasn't right. But, but next time, next time, next time, I'll stay up later and get it done, et cetera, et cetera. And what happens the next time? Oh, but that was, I got it in, and I, I didn't get a 100%. I still got to see. I'll pick someone that better next time. Um, but it goes through our head again, and, and then we make that choice, and all of a sudden we find ourselves looking off of papers, copying other things down. Why? Because it just becomes easy. Our heart becomes calloused so easily when we repeat the sin over and over again. And Jesus is saying is that as he continues to reveal truth to the people that were listening, the more often they said no, the harder their hearts became. And so he concealed truth. It's that fruit within the shell. It's there. But it was going to take some effort. It was going to take discipline on the part of the hearer, those that were listening, in order to get the truth that is out of that. The gospel is life to those that receive it. Okay? The gospel is life. Freedom from sin? The chains removed? You mean my past isn't held against me? But what about this in my past? What about No. The gospel is life. You're freed up to live, to live for him. But you know what? The gospel is death to those that reject it. Have you ever thought of that? Well, well it brings freedom to the, to the hearer who follows after it. The gospel brings death to those that reject it. But there's hope. Verse 15, it says that their hearts become calloused, Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and in turn, and turn, and I would heal them. There's also a second heart condition, and that's the heart that's been healed. It's the heart that's been healed. Again, if you're here this morning and you know that your sins have been forgiven, if you've accepted that forgiveness of sin, there's a healing that's taken place. Our hearts are healed. I don't have to carry around my past. I talk about pornography. Right? I talk about the fact that, hey, that's something that I've wanted, that I go back to and, and have a desire to pick up that, that burden. No, I don't, I don't have to pick that up. I don't have to be ashamed. I can leave that over there and say, you know what? God's taken that from me. That's not something I have to go back to. There could be healing that takes place. What is it in your life that God has healed you from? That He has set you free from so that you can live for Him. Don't go back and pick it back up. That's what He's, been, that's what he's freed us from. Which draws me to Ezekiel. And you can turn there if you'd like. It's one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 36. I'll put up the, the verse that I appreciate in particular is, is verse 26. But Ezekiel 36, it starts in verse 24. God speaking to the, to the nation of Israel. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. 
I will remove from your from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Your past that you're carrying this morning, the things that Satan brings up in your mind to remind you of, of, of who you were, he says, I'm, I'm taking that, uh, that heart of stone, uh, that anger, that bitterness, whatever it is that's in your heart, he says, I will give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. It says that the Spirit is going to remind us of the, of the good things that we are called to do. Again, if you've given your life to Christ, that Spirit lives within you and He continues to call you to, to follow it, to trust Him, to follow after Him. He removes that heart of stone, that callous heart that can't see or hear. And He says, I, I can make it. You can't do that on your own. The people were looking for a Messiah They've been looking for a Savior for years. For years. And here He was. Look at verse 16 and 17 as we close. But blessed are your eyes, because they see... Now this is Jesus speaking to the disciples. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears hear, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you are seeing but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but not hear it. People have been looking for this Messiah for years, the prophets, righteous people. And he says, now I'm here, I'm giving you truth, I'm giving you freedom, I'm giving you the gospel. It's right here. People have been looking for this for years. You get to see it. It's going to be revealed to you. The parables that we study will reveal truth to you. And so as I close, I just call you to trust the Holy Spirit to reveal that which is concealed. I don't know what God wants to teach you. I don't know what He wants to teach you through these parables. But there is the gift of hope and there is the mystery of the Gospel found in these parables. You can trust God's Word. It will be revealed to you through the Holy Spirit. And second of all, this, this parable that uh, is on in verses uh, 3 through 9 and then is explained in verses 18 and following. We're going to be looking at these in two weeks, talking about the condition of the heart. When the Spirit convicts, repent. When the Spirit convicts, repent. James McDonald says, get as low as you can, as quick as you can. It's pretty good advice. Pretty good advice. I haven't talked about any specific sins about you this morning. We looked at one from my life, from my past. Again, the pornography is in the past. Lust today is in the present, right? That's what I have to deal with today. I don't know what the Spirit brings to your mind. My guess is there's all kinds of things going through your head as, as far as what the Spirit brings back to you. I would say if He's calling you to repent, whatever it is, get as low as you can, as quickly as you can. Yeah, but if I go and talk to my husband about this, then get as low as you can, as quick as you can. You can trust him in that. You can trust him in that. The Spirit is speaking to us. He calls to us. He says, you don't have to carry around that burden. And that calloused heart, I continue to make it soft. I can heal that. Trust me with that. Trust me with that. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, um, your, your word comes too, too close to home from my heart sometimes, too many times. Lord, I, I'm again reminded that, that you speak to us in, in the place where we're at with the things that we're dealing with. And we come from all over. We come from all over, whether it's all over Heston, all over central Kansas, wherever we come from this morning as we gather and, and your spirit speaks to us, that's, that's what he does. That's why you've given him to us so that our hearts might be changed from stone um, to a soft heart that is healed. And Lord, we trust you in, in the baby steps and in, in the little steps that you give us each and every day to, to be trusting you because it doesn't happen overnight. 
and as, as we continue to, to give back to you and to trust you for, for, for healing, for repentance. Perhaps, Lord, uh, this morning, someone, someone will ask for forgiveness and, and we'll have to decide whether or not we will give that away. That, that can be equally as difficult, difficult when, when, we've been, when we've been hurt. Lord, continue to, to allow us to give, give things up. Give things up that, that you call us to. There's so much freedom that is found in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for revealing him through the power of your Holy Spirit. We, we need that today. We need that each and every other day. Each and every day. I, I pray for the offering that we're about to take. Um, not only, Lord, have, have you blessed us spiritually, you've also blessed us physically and financially. Uh, we praise you for that. We thank you. And, and Lord, this act of worship of, of the offering is, is just again saying, Lord, all of us, all of what we have is yours. Our finances, our homes, our vehicles, our children, our work, our lives, all of this, Lord, is yours. We thank you so much. Thank you for making us stewards of this. May we, may we f- freely share, not just here this morning, but throughout the week with those that we encounter. In Jesus' name, amen.